Welcome back to the Gymnazo Podcast. I'm your host, Kalina Ruskin, and I am joined with our owner, founder, CEO, movement specialist extraordinaire, Michael Hughes. Wow, that was nice. And today we are discussing three-dimensional programming, mm. uh, which is a topic that I think we're both super excited to actually dive into and talk about and how it's revolutionized our, our training styles and really what Gymnazo truly is all about, the kind of the foundation for that. So... Uh, let's just jump right into this. Super stoked. <laughs> like, like, this is the topic. I love it. Michael, so what, are, straight up, let's break it down for us. What are the three planes of motion? What is 3D programming? Ooh, okay. So, uh, page one, right? Page one kinesiology book. There's no, you know, there's no such thing as a kinesiology book. But, right, so you, have, so you have three planes of motion. Forward and backwards, sagittal plane, side to side, frontal plane, rotational plane or the transverse plane three planes of motions Easy. as simple as it gets but that's where it stops <laughs> that's where the uh, most of the train just stops i understand they're there um, sometimes people call it a coronal plane versus another word but you know sagittal frontal transverse we try to break it up as much as as simple as possible but forward and back side to side rotational and programming for it is really simple just move the body in those three cardinal motions. It's like paint a picture with red, blue, and yellow. Sounds pretty easy. Right. I mean, you know, it's really simple. It's really simple in concept. Um, uh, but to apply it, you have to unthink. You have to uneducate and re-educate. It's like, wait a minute. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to go too deep too fast. But it's really that simple is that we have these motions available to our body in physics. Um, why don't we train that way? Why don't we train that way? Now, I shouldn't be asking questions here, but, you know, so that was kind of my rhetorical question <laughs> in a sense. Totally. I mean, what, I can't speak from the kinesiology standpoint because I was actually an animal science major. It's true. But I've always been an athlete. Yeah. But what are people traditionally taught in school about the three planes of motion? Other than just there's three of them, you know, what, what does it dive deep into? deeper into anything or is it literally just it stops it these are three planes yeah and i'm gonna speak from you know i've been out of college for oof, well longer than i want to admit <laughs> but uh in the early 2000s which is still you know the day of the internet you know <laughs> google searches will still will still there um that's where it kind of stopped we recognized that there was these three planes of motion so it's like the first topic that we ever discussed like page one of the book mm -hmm. and you know it was we went to biomechanics which college, high school biomechanics, it's really too simple. It's like, oh, this is the hinge joint, this is the lever, and this is the fulcrum, and da, da, da. And that's just, that's not enough, right? Yeah. Because we talked about how the elbow joint primarily moves in flexion and extension, mm -hmm. which would be more, more than basically sagittal plane. Yeah. Right? And the ball and socket joint of the shoulders and the hips, well, they, are, they'll have, they have omnidirections. You know, not pure, right? Mm -hmm. But for the most part. But we didn't really talk about how it can really go through the frontal and transverse planes. We certainly said like abduction and adduction and internal external rotation. Those words were spoken, but it wasn't put into context, at least for me, mm -hmm. at my college, which was a, you know, it's, we're not talking about like a Brown University, you know, we're yeah. talking about a California state school, um, but was known for physical therapy. Um, you know, not USC physical therapy, excuse me. Um, but that's kind of where it's, we didn't really talk about like, oh, wait a minute, this is how the bones can move and here's what the proprioceptors can do and how it trains and conditions the body. And it's not practice makes uh, perfect, it's practice makes permanent. Mm -hmm. um, it r didn't even touch that. It was just, this is the way it is. This is the machines that we use. Here's what studies have shown and mm -hmm. this is where we're gonna go. Mm -hmm. It was, this is our past education. Let's continue that education. Yeah. Um, and I had, honestly, then I had no clue. Yeah. It was not even a thought process because I trusted those who were teaching me. Yeah. And after college, what personal training certification did you go through? Ooh, so in college, I got the ISSA, International Sports Science Association. Mm -hmm. uh, started personal training when I was a sophomore in college. Like, I should probably get a job in the field that I want to go into. Yeah, that was that'd my be thought helpful. process. Being an Abercrombie and Fitch selling you know, clothing <laughs> at minimum wage. Yeah. 
anyways, different story, different podcast. <laughs> were you were you front desk or were you a, I was po- a poster front, boy? I was front room. Yeah, front room, which is basically a poster. So you probably person. have a little bit of like brain damage from inhaling all of those perfumes and uh, colognes. Yeah. For <laughs> luckily, the cologne then was not the cologne now. Fierce is what it is. <laughs> And I really liked the first one. And then they changed it, and they haven't changed it in, well, going on more than a decade. Yeah. I mean, you can smell that stuff from about a quarter mile away, and you're like, there's an Amber Crombie store somewhere <laughs> around somewhere. here. It still resonates with me. <laughs> it's still, you know, scent is memory tied to anyways. Anyway, um, diving back. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> everybody. In. What do you, you know, going through well, the yeah. ISSA, you know, what was the yeah, again, typical training method? Again, first page of the book, in a sense. You know, it took the human body and cut it up into three pieces. Yeah. And that, again, that was it. And it was really mind-boggling. Like, that's like the crux of, the, of movement. Mm-hmm. But they put it across the entire body. Yeah. So we just made it think like, oh, cool. All right. So I, it just, it's, it's like, oh, it's just more of a reference mm-hmm. to how the body can be described yeah. versus joint by joint, movement by movement, muscle by muscle, mm-hmm. even neurological pathway, even different certain nerves get mm-hmm. turned on, activated in certain movement patterns. Yeah. Like didn't even touch that. So, um, so I say, which again, I say it's not designed for that. I don't want to beat up ISSA. It's just, a, it's called entry level certification. Yeah. Um, and then going into grad school, even, I even took some, some physical therapy courses in undergraduate and it was awesome. We talked about like biomechanics of the foot and I was like, oh, this is what I'm here yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but again, didn't talk about how, you know, really the mid tarsal bones really get locked up through inversion, eversion, which is a combination of frontal plane and transverse plane motion. Yeah. Didn't touch, didn't touch that. Yeah. I just, I don't know, maybe I didn't dive deep enough, you know, I mean, for all those people who've gone to physical therapy school and, you know, chiropractic school, then maybe they dive into that. Um, yeah. but, uh, for my un- undergraduate, not even a hint. So, so tell us about when you realized I think there's more to this. Like, what was your first, like, Ooh. mind-blowing intro to, that's oh. different, that's, what is that? Yeah. Tell I, me about 3D movement. Literally, I'm in my memory right now, picture in memory. Um, I was at our local big box gym here, we'll name it Kenny Club Fitness, and it was after a conversation I had with someone who had already been drinking the juice, mm-hmm. you know, someone who's already been kind of mind-opened in a sense. And I said, well, so, like, what is this three planes of motion? She says, Michael, honestly... Um, just do a movement in three different planes of motion. I'm like, uh, like, like, like a plank? She's like, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, that's a good start. Yeah. So I remember literally going to the blue mats behind the little palm leaf tree thing divider because the stretching area is different than the other area. You got <laughs> you to segregate them. Yep. Cardio is different than strength. Segregate those things. Very important. Sorry, traditional fitness. And um, I remember doing literally a sagittal plane hip drive, which is, looks like you're humping the ground. Yep. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. It's very functional. S- <laughs> side to side hip motion. And literally taking my pelvis, keeping it flat, like I'm going to not spill water. I can hold the glass on my pelvis and slide it left to right. And then turning it. Right pocket turns down to the ground. Left pocket goes up on the ground and vice versa. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that, that's it. I was like, that's pretty simple. Yeah. And it's that's it. It's pretty Basic. simple. Yeah. yeah. I mean that's that's the that's a pelvis going through all three planes of motion. I didn't really talk about us individual muscle or individual joint. That's many joints. Mm-hmm. Thoracic spine, lumbar spine, both acetabulums, both you know, the knees are spinning, the ankles are spinning, the feet, mm-hmm. you know, everything spins. Yeah. Even the shoulders spin. Um yeah, so that was my first introduction into three planes of motion movement. And it was cool because I was like, Well, I'm feeling so much more of my core than a static isolation hold, don't look at anybody weird plank, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, and it was ma- amazing. It's like, I feel, my, I feel more oblique than I've ever, ever felt before. I felt, uh, felt like my s- lateral g- glutes open up, you know? Mm-hmm. Like that, I was like, wow, I feel my lateral hips talking a little bit. And I feel, I actually feel my, my, my lats working. So I was like, wow, my lats are working with my core, with my legs. Yeah. Well, you're moving through motion, so inherently your tissues have to work harder to decelerate and accelerate motion every time you change direction, going right. from up to down, going from left to right, right. And rotating left to right. Again, from a basic certification, I mean, even a deep dive, I was studying CSCS, n- nothing. Yeah. Just didn't bring it up. Not, I'm, I'm sure the authors knew it, but they didn't talk about it, at least yeah. not at an in-depth level. Yeah. So then, okay, we discover a 3D hip drive. Right. 
So what next? Like, where did your brain go from there? Obviously you're like, this feels better, this, or this feels different. I feel yeah. more. What's, what's the next step? Did you start straight away? Like, okay, how do I 3d this? How do I 3d that? And then we got to dive into the gray institute. Yeah. After that. Yeah. So, you know, eventually the story goes into, you know, getting my fellowship, mm-hmm. you know, other cases, but, um, then it was really kind of taking to what we consider or what we call our 3d lunge. Matrix, yes. right? And whenever we use the word matrix, we're just talking about a bit of three pattern movement or three or six patterns, um, hence the matrix. We're not you know, neo fans in a sense, you know, blue pill, red pill stuff, but um, a matrix of movements. And it was so crazy because I remember doing like being shown a lunge matrix. I was like, okay, lunging forward, easy peasy. Got it. Lateral lunge, all right, a little bit, a little bit different, mm-hmm. but it's super simple. And the other four were like, uh, what did just happen? <laughs> <laughs> How did I, like, that's weird. Yeah, totally. And it's like, if you really break it down, it's not weird. You do it every single day. Yes. Every single day you do those, not in that big of a range of motion, but literally the same biomechanics. Absolutely. Literally. So let's talk about that. So forward lunge, pretty, pretty simple. Lateral lunge, you know, pretty simple. We'll talk about our right foot. But then going to what we call a common transverse plane, where your right foot opens up to the right, that's just called turning around in your kitchen. Yep. That simple. Mm -hmm. And one leg stays put as the other leg travels first. And there's relatively external rotation happening at both hips. Mm -hmm. One's in open stance, one's in connected to the ground, close. Open chain, closed chain. Very, very simple. And then we'll go to the uncommon, which is the ones we do less common, right? Mm-hmm. It was that simple. It's like, oh, what's an uncommon versus common? It's like, uh, you just don't do it that commonly. Oh, okay. Simple. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll talk about posterior lunge. And the posterior lunge was like, ooh. It's like, wait a minute. Um, so if you think about yourself listening, doing a posterior lunge, more than likely, your uh, let's go right foot is going backwards and you're putting your toe on the ground first. Yep. And we would call that a, not a lunge. How about that? We would call that a posterior toe tap. Mm-hmm. You know? And it's like, well, wait a minute. So, the, so this is getting deep dive. You can cut me off at any time here. But what's the definition of a lunge? And that's, you know. I think it's biasing weight onto one side. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's literally weight shifting to a flat foot. Mm-hmm. Just like you would step. Yeah. That's why we lunge so often here because it's the most common drill that any person does in real life, mm-hmm. right? You transfer your weight to a flat foot. Forward lunge, we do that. Sideways lunge, we do that. So what would be the definition of a backwards lunge? So it's a flat foot, posterior weight shift, Yes. right? Yeah. So if you do that in a lunge, the lunge looks a lot different. Your range of motion is a lot smaller. It's a lot more challenging proprioceptively because we're not used to moving backwards either right. and, and transitioning that weight to a back foot right but we do sit down backwards on a chair or a couch that's very true i know i know but we don't think you know no. but you just fall there's no deceleration i call it the plop we yeah. get to a certain range of motion then it's it's a trust fall to the rest of the couch right. or the chair right so those glutes hamstrings da, 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 you know really experience have to experience that deceleration and that loading as we call it fancy word for eccentric muscle contraction mm-hmm. and it's weird and people use the toe out, and it gets all, you know, that's mm-hmm. a def- another topic. And then a crossover. So right foot goes right. We call that a lateral 90-degree lunge. But what about right foot going left? Uncommon frontal plane Uncommon. Lunge. A super crazy adduction at the hip joints. Yes. And very weird. But we just call that a grapevine move, yep. right? And that's just part of a grapevine yep. move. Or a karaoke. Karaoke, yeah. whatever you want to call it, braided run, right? We do that all the time in sports. We have been doing that since... It's a warm up. Yeah, it's part of your warm up. I did that in baseball in like fourth, third grade. <laughs> you know, just a crossover run. Yeah, um, and we do it often when we're trying not to fall over, or when we just need to take a little funky step because we're moving something. It's very, it's common, but it's not as un, you know, therefore. Yeah. And then instead of right foot rotating to the right, as I just take my whole body there, I just can't <laughs> do it. Uh, your right foot rotates left. And it's a, essentially, it's an internal rotation of your stance leg, your leg that's not moving. And it's just basically turning to the left with your right foot. And mm-hmm. again, we do that all the time. Anytime you turn down a hallway, yep. you do that move. Walking around a corner. Every time you walk around a corner, perfectly stated. All the time. Yep. But it's super awkward for people that can't figure it out at a greater range of motion. Yeah. To have to actually load into it and not right. just flow Fall. through it yeah, or nice ambulate job. through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They have to actually load into that. Super right. challenging, right. super awkward at first. Right. Like, what is this? Yeah. 
And what's crazy about it is with this lunge matrix, with three-dimensional training, you get hip flexion, hip extension, hip abduction, hip adduction. I'm saying those a little differently so you can hear it. Hip internal and external rotation. You get all six hip joint motions and knee motions and ankle motions. You get everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In six moves. It's a sweet way to actually dive right into like how the Gray Institute teaches three planes of motions and AFS and taking those six lunges and turning it into what we know as our 3D maps. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. And how that 3D, we can evaluate every joint at the body and get and with any of those motions and get a complete analysis. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. So Gray Institute, that's where, that's kind of like... How do I call that? You know, they are like, well, applied functional science. I think it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Applied functional science is a study of the physical sciences. Cool. So what are physical sciences? Well, there's quite a few of them, but we'll just call it physics. And what are the truths, right? You know, not the theories. I mm -hmm. mean, even though technically gravity is a theory. Mm, you know, I'm going to drop this pen 100, out of 10, 100 times it's going to fall. We'll yeah. call it a, a principle for the sake of the matter. And then the biological principles. Okay, so our physiology, our, bi our, bi our biology... And then our behavioral sciences, what are the truths there? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the things, you know, how do people think, move, educate, um, encourage, da, 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 da. And that's what it is. It's a, it's a collection of methodologies. That's what I really love about what the Green Institute has packaged so well. They package it really well, though, for physical therapists, mm -hmm. really well. Mm -hmm. And we just took it, said, thank you very, very much. You guys are amazing rock stars. And we packaged it for the trainer. Yeah. And that's it. Well, there's a lot more to that, but you know, that's permission. So I want you to answer that question if that's okay. Yeah. Cause you're the, I mean, I'm the first one to do it, mm -hmm. but you had to kind of learn from us and then went to them. I did. So I'm, I'm yeah, but I felt know. like I had the cheat codes cause I got, I got all of the, uh, the experience prior to starting my, my, you know, AFS journey. Mm -hmm. And I had, my only background was in strength and conditioning from what I knew from high school and then from college. Collegiate soccer, by yeah, the way. Collegiate, yeah, collegiate Division soccer. One. Division one. Yeah, yeah. No joke. So, you know, we had strength and conditioning coaches. I loved lifting. I loved, like, oh, man, any, anything. Deadlifts, back squats, box jumps. I loved all that. It was primary sagittal plane. And my first experience, you know, getting into gymnasio, because I was, I was in, like, a a desk job that I hated, <laughs> that I was trying to get out of. That, yeah. And, I, you know, I was coaching a bunch of soccer at the time. I was running my own strength and conditioning program at the high school with the, the girls' soccer team that I was coaching. And my now husband, then boyfriend, was like, why don't you get paid to do this? Because I was doing it for free. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was fun and I liked it, but, it, you know, I was getting up at 6 in the morning to coach, like, four girls and not get paid for it. So it's like, why don't you get paid to do this? I was like, okay. All right, so I started going through NASM, and I was kind of looking for coaching jobs and personal training jobs, and I happened to have a soccer parent say, hey, I know this couple who owns a gym, and they just posted that they're looking for interns. I said, okay, cool, I'll go, I'll go check it out. You know, the beauty of a small town is right. you get, <laughs> everybody knows everybody. It's like, okay, I'll check it out. And I, I remember looking at the Gymnasio website, and I was like, this makes sense. It's like, this mm. actually looks cool. It wasn't your traditional um, kind of meathead gym. I was like, and I am a science dork anyway. So that appealed to me right off the bat. Yeah. So getting in, and I remember, you know, I did my homework on what, what gymnasium was. Oh, I, I, did, I don't know if I read all the reviews. I read through the website, there you, go. you know, to hear, to see what the deal was. Like, what the, the, my God, they have a philosophy. They have a mission statement. They have, they have ideas and theologies based in science and three planes of motion. I was like, well, this, this is pretty rad. And it just made so much sense. It made so much sense, so much more than, than just traditional strength and conditioning. And as somebody who was, is an athlete, multifaceted athlete, you know, I played division one soccer, but I'm an avid golfer. I love to trail run. I surf, I snowboard. I go, this feels more like sports. And this feels more natural than just moving straight up and down and just doing deadlifts and just doing kettlebell swings. And I still, don't get me wrong, I still love all those things, but three places movement was like, whoa, this makes so much more sense to how we actually train. And, and that was something when I got introduced to the Gray Institute, when Gary was saying, or Doug would say like, it should, an exercise should look, smell, and feel like your sport. I was like, 
that makes a lot of sense. And that was, that was really cool to like kind of connect those bridges and, and then get into that and go, yeah, this is what my hip goes through when I hit a soccer ball. But there's a thousand different ways to strike a soccer ball. Mm-hmm. And it's not the same biomechanics for each one, mm-hmm. you know, different, Crazy. you know, different, different ways to pass the ball, different ways to, to dribble the ball require different skill sets and different motions from my foot, my ankle, my hips, you know, my thoracic spine, even, you know, this makes way more sense to go through all of this and how it should, things should be moving rather than just kind of a more regimented strict. This is just how we train. Mm-hmm. Cause what else will happen in college I mean, I love to lift and I'm super competitive. So when winter came around, because winter is the off season, that was bulk up season. And uh, I did, I was successful in that. (laughs) (laughs) It was a good bulk season. But then we'd go play soccer in the spring and I'm probably 10, 15 pounds heavier. Some of it muscle, some of it beer season, (laughs) you know. Um, But I'm probably a little bit heavier than I was. We hardly did any 3D training, definitely no mobility, definitely not a lot of agility work, and I got hurt. I was as strong as I could possibly be. I was maxing out, you know, top of the charts, and I'm not, like, the biggest player on the team. I'm 5'5", and I'm getting hurt every spring because my body goes, you just went from a strict regimented lifting program, powerlifting program, and now you want me to go be agile, mobile, and explosive, and I lacked all of those things. In multiple angulations. In multiple angulations. Right. And we, I, we didn't train that way. Didn't train that way at all. I don't think I did one lateral lunge in all of college. Hmm. It was, wow. yeah, which wow. is, is like, <laughs> yeah, and mind-blowing now. So, you know, getting introduced to AFS and getting introduced to 3D, I was like, yeah, I do that motion all the time. That transverse plane lunge, that's a drop step to go change direction, you know? Exactly. And I go, that makes so much sense for injury prevention, for just mobility purposes. Like, that makes way more sense than just... Yeah, and proprioceptive, like, yeah. just your body's used to the motion. Yeah. It's not crazy. It's not funky. It's not weird. It's not like, uh, uh It just doesn't. Yeah. And my body never felt compromised. It felt like, oh, yeah, we, we kind of know what this is. It just needed a little bit more proprioceptive awakening mm-hmm. to really master, you know actual load bearing and heavy, heavy weights now in, in all three planes. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned the, the, the 3d map. So that's a certification, yes. um, movement analysis, uh, three dimensional, uh, movement analysis, performance systems, Grain Institute did. And we use that for our warm up. We use that for our, uh, uh movement, un- our, well, our movement assessment. Mm-hmm. And that kind of, you could, uh, just to give you some comparison, that's like using Gray Cook's, um, M, gosh, well, why I'll go blank totally on this one, movement screen. Um, and I don't want to call it comparable, um, but in a sense, it's the same ballpark, right? Any movement screening thing. And uh, why we use 3D maps is because you get to look at every single joint. You know, what, 66? joints, 60 major joints, we get to see them on all three planes of motion, standing upright. We can modify it if it's a mm-hmm. chair-bound athlete, if it's a swimmer, right? We can modify it for golfer, we can baseball, we can modify it for anything. Mm-hmm. That's a cool part about it because we just put ourselves in those positions and then do the same motion patterns, essentially. Um, and we can see how everything flexes, extends internally, externally rotates, abducts and adducts in gravitational load. Yes. Which changes everything. Yeah. Everything. That made, that made a lot of sense to me, too, when we talked about, you know, when we look at the, the textbooks and how they evaluated how joints moved and how muscles mm, worked. This is crazy. A lot of so. it was on machines. Well, it was a dead person on a table. Yeah, or, or a dead person <laughs> on a table. And it was like, well, this is how this works. This is how this works. And you're like, but... They're dead on a table. Right. They're not moving, and they're, there's certainly no there's no mass and momentum. There's mm-hmm. no gravity, right. and so how can you, well there's gravity just it's influenced correct, in a but it's way. it's differently because most of our our most of our performance things are an upright right. function exactly right you know so to how do you say the quad works like this lying down on a table versus the quad works like this when you're running mm-hmm. those are two t- entirely different yeah things in fact almost the opposite yeah. Yeah. That's a crazy thing. It is. And so, I mean, there's plenty of benefits to isolating out tissues and saying this is how it works, this is how sure. it works. But when you only look at it from an isolated point of view, 
we're very multi-complex creatures and multi-dimensional creatures when it comes to movement. So how can we say that the isolated test mm-hmm. is relative to upright, functional, multi-dimensional, multi-loading movement? Yeah. Can I deep dive on something real fast? Go if you do it. Okay. Thanks. So um, uh, for those for those listening, it's not just that simple as three planes of motion, right? Yes. I mean, we're talking about gross motor patterns or we're talking about l- global patterns, right? <laughs> As clean as dive into local patterns or isolated patterns, you know, some of you probably been maybe potentially quite freaked out right now. It's like, oh, you just shouldn't throw the knee into rotation. No. You shouldn't throw the lower back rotation. And I'm going to say, uh, yes, you're right, 100% right, but there's context to that. It's not, you know, you can't just do a blind statement as we're doing blind statements, but there, there's more to it. We know that. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's an example. The knee, I'm not going to get too crazy on you, loves flexion extension loves it it's designed for that yep but it also can and should go through the other two planes of motion valgus and varus or abduction and adduction mm-hmm. and internal and external rotation mm-hmm. how it does that though is very important yes very important especially the rotation piece because the knee needs to rotate but there's called in sync and out of sync or both tib and fib and femur rotate in the same direction at the same time at the same speed, uh, relatively speaking, Mm -hmm. and they don't. And when they go the opposite direction at different speeds with no ability to decelerate, well, you have a problem. Yeah. And that's not something that you should probably train your client to do under those loads because you're just not going to manage it. Correct. But on the other side of the spectrum, shouldn't you train it to be proprioceptically aware of that so it can do all that it has in its power to stop that from happening. Physics are physics. Sometimes getting hit by a, a bus is not preventable, <laughs> and you're going to get injured, right? But what are those things that are preventable? You know, it's really having that mindset, like we're going to do everything we possibly can in the laws of physics. So, mm-hmm. we per- so it's not injury prevention, it's injury avoidance. Mm-hmm. And so it's understanding that the knee has the capacity to out of sync rotate a few degrees, Yes. And we should learn to, to control that yeah. very appropriately, very intelligently, not just like blindly. Here's a kettlebell swing no. and start spinning it in circles and figure it out. No, that's, re- that's it. That's it. It, it, it is, it's not responsible. It's not ethical. It's not intelligent. So don't just go do that, right? Training conditioning is a progressive overload process, mm-hmm. but not just from muscles, from bones, from nerves, from mental mindset. So I had to kind of put that in there because we're just talking about rotating through the knee. Yes, contact dependent. It's all yep. about the context. So, sorry, that was my soapbox. Very important soapbox in my mind, though. So yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, like when we just look at talking about you know the common transverse plane step, we're gonna get that out of sync. Femur is gonna spin faster than the tib fib, yeah, right, of right. the planted leg. Right. But at what what speed you're going at, at what range of motion you're going at, and depending on what you're trying to do with right. it, like and the context completely matters. Right, and if the tissues have the capacity to do it. Yeah, and you can give the, t- the tissue that capacity. You could teach it to do it at those right. higher speeds, higher volumes, but you don't start there. Right, yeah. So just very important. Three planes of motion, we are um, nuts about it. N- yeah. Fanatics about <laughs> it. But there is such thing as calling starting from success. Yeah. I mean, w- and we get even dive into what, coupling and troupling is uh, yeah you know because we broke it down into three planes but we said it's more complex than that because it's it's always multi-dimensional it is not just pure plane mm-hmm. it's actually never well it's, never don't never say never but you're certainly yeah. gonna you're certainly gonna have planes of motion that are more oh gosh what's the word i'm looking for more prevalent, yeah. you know, with a, with a anterior obvious. lunge right it's an anterior more. lunge but you're still gonna get minor degrees of lateral flexion and rotation from every, from somewhere else in the body, from the ankle, from the knee, from the hip. Yeah, and, and I've mentioned this before in previous podcasts, but like an anterior lunge, yes, the body is moving forward, but you have to look at the micro motions. Mm-hmm. The foot, when it lands, it pronates. Yeah. And it, it can supinate too. It depends on what surface you're on. But mm-hmm. pronation and supination is a combination of movements mm-hmm. of all three dorsiflexion, or maybe if you're running crazy down downhill, it's plantar flexion, mm-hmm. right? But it's still flexion. And then there's going to be eversion or inversion, which is going to be a combination of frontal plane and transverse plane, right? And to understand, like, this was the big, like, aha motion, uh, moment for, for me. 
and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this, but, but uh, this context before, but like sagittal plane and frontal plane, gravity will throw you to the ground. Mm -hmm. If you can't control it, there's a tipping point. If yeah. you can't stop that tipping point, you're down. Mm -hmm. But rotational movement is perpendicular to gravity. Therefore, it cannot throw you to the ground, hmm. right? If you isolate it, right? Yeah. It is not gravity dependent. Yeah. Therefore, it's free movement. So therefore, when you look at all power sports, our activities, rotation is the common, I mean, not everywhere, but it's the common denominator. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like that like blew my mind. <laughs> so how do you train for rotation? Well, you swing a baseball mat more. You kick a soccer ball more. You know, you go bowling more. But well, how do you do it in the training facility? You got to rewrite how you program. Yeah, the, you got to rewrite it. Yeah. Well, they tell you to resist rotation. I know. In a, in a I in gym know. setting, and that will somehow make you stronger at rotation. I mean, it's going to make you stronger, but you're at what? At yeah. Resisting rotation. Yeah. But what if you need? I mean, what if you yeah. have to? Yeah. Swinging a baseball bat, you need rotation. I know. Swinging so at a golf club. That that quote from Green Stu, really, you know, it's just physics, right? They didn't invent yeah. it. What I love about the Green Stu, they didn't invent it. He says that they said, we're not inventing anything. We're just packaging it together so you can understand the complexity and the aweness, mm -hmm. the awesomeness of this world and the missed opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. If you are an athlete or you train athletes, should you incorporate? rotational strength training, training with weight in rotation. Yeah, and that's a big, that's a really broad statement, right? Yeah. So when you talk about the knee, da, 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 right? It calls a context, but if you say no, then I'm going to beat you. My team's going to beat you. Yeah. Like, okay, real quick, ready for this <laughs> So doing our 3D maps, this is so cool with any like high school athlete, especially a high school athlete that's like junior varsity varsity. Actually, it works for anybody, especially the, okay, sorry. It works for everybody, especially when they play sports competitively. When I do a movement analysis on them, and I know they can't do, let's say, a right open rotation, which is mm -hmm. 135 degrees open rotation, you know, give it, you know, it's a different on the on the left side of the of the compass, but 135 degrees open rotation, and they're like miserable going one one way. Their foot pivots. They don't have the coordination. I say they're a basketball player. I'm like. I'm going to beat you so good in basketball. <laughs> and they look at me you like, can't go what? Right. I, say, I know now, I know where you're not good at movement. Yeah. And I'm going to drive to that side all day yep. long. And you're either going to beat me in the beginning and then fatigue out in the end. Yeah. Or you're just, I'm just going to beat you from the get go. Cause you just, you just, you're, you are a motor moron in a way to say it, that direction. <laughs> or if they're miserable at a posterior lunge, I'm going to come right at you. Yeah. Every time. And until you stumble, then I'm going to change a direction. It's like, it's so, it's this amazing insight. It's like reading the third base um, signs in baseball, you know, mm -hmm. or understanding what the pitcher's telling the, uh, the catcher telling the pitcher, like from second base, like the base, run. like you get, you get this deep insight mm -hmm. into how to just murder somebody, excuse me, totally beat somebody <laughs> at their game. Yeah. Because you find their defaults. Absolutely. Sorry. That was like, I've been meaning to say that publicly for a long time. <laughs> It's a great way to put it, though. Well, it, it is because, you know, if you have all these options of movement and you do access them in daily life mm -hmm. and in, especially in sport, and you understand how each joint moves in all three planes of motion in the relative range of motions that they should with each other joint in any particular motion, and we can break that down. I know that you and I can. Mm -hmm. We don't have to memorize anything. It's just the context to every single motion pattern and the level of, the, of their ath athleticism. And it's like, gosh, I just, it gives you this sense about confidence. It just gives you this overall sense that you can really help somebody. Mm -hmm. And you can build a roadmap from that uh, movement assessment. And you got a thousand different ways to go. Yeah. Even if you're not an athlete. No, of course. If right. you're just your average Joe or, you know, stay-at-home mom, you know, wouldn't you want to be mobile and strong at every joint you possibly could be in every plane of motion because daily life requires you to just do that. Yeah. It would be nice to move freely at all times. Yeah. Instead of having to, you know, there are people who genuinely are just trying to avoid rotation and think about it actively. When I squat to pick things up, I don't bend. I do this, I do that. And it's this very rigid context. But when we talk about kids are the best example of 3d movers, mm -hmm. 
because they don't think they just do. And it's not because they get old and they sit and they, you know, or we just get into this mindset of we can't do these things, but maybe we just haven't trained our body that way or continue to train our body that way. Mm -hmm. But kids all the time, they get on the floor, they bend, they roll. They don't think about movement. And then as we get older, now we all of a sudden we have to start thinking about movement when you go to, yeah, when you go to pick something up, I've been, you know, laughing and I'm sure it'll be an epic uh, Instagram video, but all of the information you see about working out while pregnant, Mm. don't do this, don't do that, don't rotate, it's bad for you, it's going to hurt your back, it's going to hurt your hips. I go, okay, you want me to do none of that while I'm pregnant, but then the second I leave the hospital, I'm carrying a weight on one side, or at chest. Keep going, this is beautiful. Put a baby in a friggin' car seat. (laughs) No rotation. With no rotation. And not in a minivan. Yeah. And <laughs> and don't wake up your baby either. Like, good luck with that. Or having to lift that car seat out. Those car seats are A, massive. <laughs> 50 pounds. Yeah. They Something can be 50 pounds. massive. And then you've got another, like, you know, 8 to 10 pound weight inside of it. And mm-hmm. then you've got to carry that around. And you're telling me don't rotate or don't do that. Like, it's impossible to not rotate or not laterally flex. I mean... Yes, it's going to be awkward, and you might be more stable with just a good old lock and load your core and lock and load your hips, but Mm -hmm. you're not going to get that baby in and out of your car without rotating or bending over to put baby in the crib and bassinet. We talk about, you know, being spine neutral a lot. I'm sorry. If you're short and you're putting a baby in a crib, you are not going to stay spine neutral. You're going to have to get a giant step stool. <laughs> you're going to try and like right. deadlift that baby into the crib. But mm-hmm. we know that's not going to that's not going to be long term success. So why do we tell people to not do all of these things that you're just going to do in day to day life? I know the answer. <laughs> I figured it out. Because people don't do that, they get injured doing that. They tell their doctor. I was rotating, throwing a bag of soil out of my car, and oh, my back got messed up. Yeah. Oh, <gasps> I figured it out. You shouldn't do that. I'm an om- over oversimplifying this, but data comes from somewhere. Yeah. It comes from empirical application. Yeah. And they say don't do that, and they don't really understand or deep dive because it's not the doctor's job to do that. Mm-hmm. They're very busy human beings. Mm-hmm. There's not. They're not by. Bio- they do not take anatomical biomechanics in school, maybe a, maybe a class, mm-hmm. but they understand where the muscles are. Even orthopedic surgeons, much respect, man, you guys are freaking ninjas yeah, with that knife. Stars. But you don't really dive in deep to how that foot connects to the knee, how the knee connects to that hip, and why that hip got so arthritic, mm-hmm. and how to bring that hip back to normality. Yes, it's a brand new species of b- metal and awesomeness, but why did it get there? Mm-hmm. No, well, you got hit with a baseball bat 17 times because you're mixed martial art. Okay, I get it. But if you're just some 50-year-old dude, nah, something's, something triggered that. Yeah. The body's a resilient animal. It's a resilient, it's the most resilient animal on this planet. Um, gosh, it's so much, I mean, there's so much like d- depth that we can dive into just with three planes of motion because it's as simple as just moving in all three planes of motion, mm-hmm. but it dives deep into the neuromuscular skeletal system of um, every little thing. The body keeps track of everything. So back to the comments, like, why do we we told not to do that? Because we got injured doing it. But because we didn't do that, we didn't train it. Um, I believe the more the technology in, you know, in our lives increases, the less the body has to do things. Mm-hmm. And we're simply training it very well to sit in this chair. Yeah. And to do less, which is awesome. That's really, that's called leisure. But the human body was designed to move. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a gift fellow who talked about in, uh, in their, um, second fellowship, just keep it simple, um, speech, the body's literally in constant vibration, literally it's on a, you know, on a Hertz meter, you can me- measure it. So is the planet. So is every thing here. And as that vibration starts to decrease, it gets like, I think it's like, I'm just round it here. 50 Hertz disease and death starts to happen. <laughs> And I think we're in this, again, forgive me for these numbers, but you know, we're in, we hang around the 80 to 120 range, or excuse yeah. me if I'm off on that. But yeah, once we get there, it's, it's, it's measurable. Tissue yeah. starts to decay and die, the less vibration. Well, that's the micro level, right? Super micro. It's like, well, stagnant water. Right, exactly. Um, so movement. Hmm. 
I think we should move more, at least to a certain level. Absolutely. And yeah, people work out a lot, but running on a treadmill is not enough. Like there's missed opportunities. Yeah. If I can get anything across, training and conditioning in any way, shape, or form is relatively good. But don't miss the opportunity of the other 66%, just to keep it simple. Yeah. What do, what do our clients say about 3D training? I mean, I'm going to toot our own horn here. What, what's our client retention rate? Uh, about 3%. Oh, excuse me, 97%. Yeah. Our client retention rate. <laughs> yeah, like, Na- like, yeah, 3%, no. Michael, jeez. How are you guys in business? 97%, 97%, which is insane, which is insane, because yeah. what's, what's the average, average gym? Oh, a good number is mm-hmm. 10%, is keeping, uh, is, is only losing 10% or keeping 90%. That's yeah. good, like, man, good, great job. Yeah, and if you're at, like, those 24-hour fitnesses, it's those crunch 50%. fitnesses, yeah, but how many of those people don't even use their membership? Um, 50% plus. Yeah. So we're talking, we have a 97% retention rate and we have, what, what do you think our capacity is coming into the gym every single week? Ooh, every single week. I think, Ooh, got to do some quick math here. 75, uh, 50 an hour. So ooh, boy, you know, 300. I think we're, uh, we're about, uh, just over 1500 spots. Visits per week. Visits per week. Yeah. That could be s- the same person. But yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's pretty incredible. So clearly, our clients enjoy 3D movement. Would you say that? I would say it is a revolution to their mindset and life. And why do we think that clients enjoy 3D movement? Why is this? Why are we so different? Other than the behavioral stuff that we had a great talk about. If you missed that podcast, go back and listen yeah, to that. Yeah, that's a good one. But why do people come back? You know, we've heard 3D movement is is this or this. Everybody has their own opinion about that. Mm-hmm. But clearly, we have a clientele that says. This works for us. Yeah. Um, why? Because it's authentic. It feels athletic. It's challenging. It's freeing. You literally walk out of here better than you walked in with yeah. more motion. Yeah, your muscles are tired. Yeah, your, you know, your lungs are like, okay, I need to chill, chill out a little bit. But you can literally move better. And that is, you cannot deny the human psyche when you have a more freeing lofty, airy, uh, what's the word I'm trying to, you know, uh, when you walk better, simply yeah. that it. Well, we hear that, you know, working out should, for some people, is strictly gains, muscular gains, strength right. gains. But I would say majority of people don't necessarily, they want to get stronger, but they're not necessarily trying to push 100 pounds up overhead. Mm-hmm. I think more people, especially we have, uh, I'm going to say, an older clientele. Yeah, right? definitely, without you know, a question. We, our median age is probably 45, mm-hmm. you know, and they're not trying to bulk up. They're not trying to be physique-driven athletes. They straight up, they want to move better. Mm-hmm. So when they see these weird, bizarre 3D <laughs> med ball slams, but they walk out and they go, I move better. That's their end goal, and that's what they take away from all of this. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of funny because different demographic types, not age demographic, but occupation demographics, mm. the more engineer, the more um, scient- scientists in a sense, you know, um, the more they, the faster they get it. Yeah. In fact, we just had someone walk in literally a day ago, uh, last Friday, and he's a, a, a dentist. Mm-hmm. And he says, man... I've been looking for something like this for years. That's awesome. Like you guys are moving in all the ways that the body can move. Yeah. I'm like, how do you know that? He says, well, I went to dental school. I mean, you know, I understand how anatomy connects it, <laughs> not in straight lines. He yeah. said that muscles don't connect in straight lines. Yeah. So therefore, they don't move in straight lines. Yeah. He says, I, this is how it is. Like I'm a dentist. I'm literally turning to my left all day long. Yeah. And my right shoulder can't stand it. Mm-hmm. So... I got to break the pattern. I'm like, dude, high five. Like, you know, <laughs> thanks for getting thanks it. Thanks for getting yeah, it. We yeah, didn't have, we didn't have to work very hard <laughs> for that one. So, yeah, so the more you remove in a repetitive pattern, the better the body gets to that pattern. Mm-hmm. Great news. But I hope you m- don't o- only have to move in that pattern because you're not going to be that good at it. If, you know, it's just really practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. So make everything permanent. Would you say that programming in 3D is way more fun? Oh, man. I, you know, so here's a good story. Um, YouTube, you know, it's not that old, but YouTube was my programming source. Mm-hmm. I loved it. Yeah. 50 exercises that are all crazy. Just, just, just give me crazy off-the-wall stuff because you get bored. 
Yeah. You know, um, I don't know if CrossFit changed their numbers on their website recently, but 50 drills, 50 exercises. That's what, again, could have changed. But last time I read, several years, years ago, they have 50 exercises. Yeah. We have, I mean, we, we have unlimited. Infinite. But I'm just going to say we've programmed at least 5,000. At least. Yeah. Maybe even 50,000. <laughs> I mean, we haven't maybe been open that, that long, but it's, there's no limit to the potential because you have all these micro motions that change biomechanical processes and uh, chain, chain reaction. And it's really cool. Now, we used to overdo it. Or yeah. at least, you know, because we would make matrix size everything. 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 So, like, drill one was a lunge matrix. Drill two was an overhead press matrix. Drill three was a kneeling lunge matrix. I'm going to make this stuff up. Uh, drill, drill four was a, a, a deadlift matrix. So, basically, we're giving people, by this time we're at drill number four, <laughs> we're giving them four times three yeah. <laughs> different drills. Yeah. And it's the mindset, the, the, the memory like is, is, that's that's a little much. It's yeah, and it's really it's not using your drills. Um, again, uh, there's more to training and conditioning than movement, mm-hmm. right? There's the mind, body, and soul. Mm-hmm. So you got to train all three and take into consideration they're all need to be understood. You can't overpower one because you diminish the you know da 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 da. So we backed off on it a little bit, but we also in the early days like I didn't touch isolation motion. Like, we still haven't done a strict crunch. Oh, yeah. In a decade plus. Yeah. In our programming. Yeah. You know, even, I remember the first few years, didn't touch bench press. Like, that ah, bench press. <laughs> what are you, auto, auto mechanic on your back? Like, yeah. you, know, you don't need to do that, you know? <laughs> like, that was the only functional application that we can think of. And I, we went hard. Like, if it's not upright, if it, I mean, too yeah. far. You went full, full global. Full global, yeah. And we, there were some holes in that story. But, yeah. you know, that's why, like, Olympic lifting and isolation and, you know, physique training, that's not bad. No. It's just limited. Yes. Just limited. There's a time and a place for everything. I, I really believe so. You know, and yeah. we've used plenty of isolation strategies to help people who can't maybe proprioceptively Ooh, good point. use something, say we need to isolate it. Right. You know, because even... You know, you kind of get sucked into this beautiful 3D world of functional fitness, and it's not functional, don't do it. So we need to make this as functional as freaking possible. And then your client's not successful. Right. And the days go on, at least they're still not successful, and you're trying to globally tweak and modify to make it functional mm-hmm. and get to work. You're like, it's not working. Yeah, this is good. Okay, so what do I need to do? Oh, crap, we need some isolation. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it works. It clicks. And yeah. it was just, you know, the way I put it is we have the hard wiring. Just, you know, you might need a little electrical tape somewhere. There's just something that's like off, right? You need right. to just rewire it and tape it back up. And sometimes it takes isolation. So there's literally nothing wrong with isolation. But if you only train in isolation, right, right, there, it's too much of a good thing almost. Right. Too much isolation, too much global movement. Same thing. You're same gonna, problems. You're going to have up. the well, same problems. Right. Exactly. A, a lack of a complete picture. And the cool thing is like, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll go through the grocery store once in a while and check out the, ma- the magazine rack and open up the men's fitness. Da, da, da. It's coming. Yeah. Like it's, it's getting there. Like even going on like some people's YouTube channels, I'm like, oh, okay. Nice. Like I saw a 3D lunch. They didn't call it that. Yeah. You know, they put some crazy, they always put slang to yeah. it. Um, you got to make it sexy. You got, well, you got to call it something. That, I don't know. <laughs> we like to call things the way it is. Um, but uh, it's like it's definitely coming. And it will be a, um, you know, like, like, like everything else. You know, there's still flip phones out there. Yeah. You know, some people They're bringing them back phone, now. But, you know, yeah, I know. They yeah. just brought back the Razor. And I was <laughs> like, do I want one again? Like it kind of. <laughs> I like because it's small. I like it because it's small. Um, but um, it's this kind of concept like, you know, um, the world will get educated by, uh, r- r- by results, not by case studies. Case studies are not, are not the best practices. It's an average. It's a bell curve average. And that, you know, I, I'm, I would love to bring uh, someone on here to talk about that, but a case study is an average. Mm-hmm. And average is average. Yeah. I don't like being an average trainer. I think with fitness... It's also subjective based on the person because everybody has a different way that they like to train and the way that they like to feel. Mm-hmm. So we can say, you know, X, Y, and Z with a very linear, very right. subjective, rigid 
yeah, like this know, database protocol you know? in a sense. Yeah, like, if yeah. you get all CrossFit athletes who only train CrossFit and love CrossFit, guess what? They're going to say this is the best way to train. This is how they like to do it. But and if you throw them into a 3D functional standpoint where they're like, this is not how I like to train. There's not enough power in here. They're not going to like that. And right. and that's very different from another group of, of people who who do love 3D training and go from there. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's just it's hard to say this is the best way to train because the best way is not the best for everybody. And that's, that's yeah, and that's also great. Yeah. It's also, I mean, excuse me, it's not great. It's okay. Yeah. It's fine. But that's why know? we have different facets of fitness. Everybody right. has their own little niche they like. The way right. that I kind of put it is like, well, everybody likes pizza. If you don't like pizza, we can't be friends. <laughs> <laughs> like, everybody likes pizza, but there's different styles of pizza. Mm-hmm. And you might prefer one style of pizza versus the other. We think that our way is the best style of pizza, though. So, yeah. I mean, that's kind of, you know... It, I, and here's what we talk about. I totally get you. You know, it's like we can't get entrapped in our own dogma. Yeah. Right? That's really important. It's really important. And, you know, I, I think why we're so, um, we're so uh, bullish, we're so excited about 3D movement because it's such a lacking piece in the industry. And we have this, like, this light that we want to hold as high as possible. Be like, guys, come on. I'll, you know, if you're stuck, you just can't figure it out. If you're in yeah. pain, you know, your, your, your performance peaked. I got something for you. Yes. And we want to bring, we want to shine that light because it's, it makes you feel as a coach. When I look at every single person as an individual Mm -hmm. and no session is ever the same, Mm -hmm. no program is, I cannot give with all my ethics, you know, the same program to the same people Mm -hmm. in one-on-one training, right? Group training, I get it, right? It's a demographic. That's what they're paying, paying for. But in terms of like movement correction, da, da, da. And it's never like, oh, you have knee pain? Oh, well, here's the program I've pre-written. No, you It just doesn't yeah, work like no. that. I mean, you can certainly save some time because there's some carryover. Yeah. Right? Some general conditioning that needs to be done. But every person is a unique problem to be solved. Yeah. That is really cool. And it takes the understanding of three-dimensional chain reaction, right? It's joint by joint. Mm-hmm. When one joint affects the other joint, biomechanics. Absolutely. And it's pretty complicated. Yeah. But it's a system. The body gives us the answers. We just got to see it. Yeah. It's easily one of my favorite yeah. favorite things about our job is being able to do that problem solving. Yeah, because the answer is always there. Yeah. Just can we, well, can we uncover it? Totally. <sighs> All right. All right. <laughs> um, uh, well, hold on. Sorry. You go for it. I'm about to do a tangent. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think people are missing out on? if they aren't training in 3D? Or what do you think trainers are missing out on if they're not programming in 3D? Yeah, so um, again, I'm gonna take this context and we're being very one-sided on this one on purpose, at least I am on purpose, uh, to kind of prove, uh, to bring a point across is that potential, right? You're missing potential. Mm -hmm. And potential, I mean, that's a big big phrase. You make your mental potential, your money-making potential, your client success potential, the number of clients that you can successfully, confidently, like, I gotcha. No problem. You got a little bit of knee pain, got a lot of knee pain. Gosh, you haven't worked out in 20 years because of your knee pain. I gotcha. Like, to say that and not ever even see them, Mm -hmm. you know, like, at least I can know where to start. Yeah. That's super super powerful. So from a coaching, just having that confidence to know that you have a way of thinking that is, there's just possibilities. Absolutely. And that's really cool. From, from an athlete standpoint, like what are you missing? Again, the word's potential, but it's kind of hard to n- know what you don't even know is there, right? That, 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 that empty space in our brain. Mm-hmm. Cause that was definitely me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was, you know, if I could meet Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, man, that would be the best thing in the world. You know, like, show me how you really got that bicep, you know, to, get look, to look like that, you know. Um, and uh, it's really, it's, it's, it's this fascination of, like, you really kind of, you attract yourself to your, to your local tribe. Mm-hmm. And um, when that tribe's surrounded by a dogma of us only versus collective, let's learn from each other, are you, you know, I don't know. Like, I want to advance technology in the human body. I want to advance training and conditioning. Like, when was the last time we had a big revolution in the training and conditioning world? It was CrossFit, actually. Yeah. Early 2000s. That was a big bomb drop on the industry. Mm-hmm. And now boutique fitness is, oof. I mean, I don't know the, the exact numbers, but it's probably just as popular mm-hmm. as big box gyms. Yeah. There was no boutique. I mean, boutique was like 
a drop in the bucket. Yeah. Now it's a dominance. Mm-hmm. You know, dominance. You look at all the, you know, you look at Orange Theory, da da da, F45. You know, and even like F45, they're cha- they're they're adding more m- three dimensional. They don't call it that. I don't mm-hmm. think they really know that they're doing it. But you know, maybe they are. I don't know the you know the franchise guys, but you know, it's definitely. Ooh, it's getting there. It's smelling a little bit different. Yeah. You know. Um, so, uh, gosh, I, mean, I forget the question you asked. <laughs> <laughs> we just wonder people, people or, or trainers missing out on if they aren't training. Oh, yeah, I'm going through the, 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 the different segments. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, but they're missing the concept that there is, this is, this is my ultimate answer, there is a career in fitness. It is not a hobby job anymore with this understanding. It's not just this like, mm, I'm young, I got some extra time. I'm going to go and train somebody. You know, I don't really know very many 45-plus trainers out there mm-hmm. that are making a living and not a slave to their trade. Mm-hmm. If you're out there, please comment. i love to chat with you and know what you're doing. Again, career, you're making all the money you want, and you're not a slave to your trade. I mean, you have to work to make, to make money. Mm-hmm. You literally have to be in person to make money. Okay. Um, so it's that potential to, to broaden your horizons of your client scope. Um, to be able to train the youth athletes all the way to I'm in a wheelchair and yep. I still need multi-joint motion pattern all the way through. And I do want to make a point, bringing up youth. Like we know we talk about like, you know, we want to make it look exactly like the movement pattern. There's a limit to that concept too, right? Totally. Especially in youth athletics. Mm-hmm. Ex- like, you know, sports specific training in youth a- athletics very fine grain of salt there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's got to be a certain age of movement development. And I know you know that being a youth coach, yeah. you know, but we made that comment. I was like, oh, wait a minute. There's always context to everything that we say. Um, but three dimensional training generally, you know, is awesome for youth. Just Absolutely. Don't always practice throwing a baseball with a seven year old. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> you know, which was at least 18. Anyways, um, so uh, just have this mindset. You know, when three-dimensional training, this understanding, this tool, so I'm closing my eyes right now because I'm like, I'm imagining what it was like prior, this knowledge. Um, and it was stuck. I just felt stuck. I always needed to copy someone else. I needed the inspiration from someone else. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, no, the inspiration is all here. Like, I get further inspired by hanging out with you guys a lot. I mean, t- to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, but it's this, it's this self-perpetuating cycle. Because we learned, like, man, I didn't even know that we can move a mope stick like that. You know? It was really this whole, like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, so you just applied this chunking technique, right? This, this yeah. triplane, you know, da 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 this and I see what you did there. And I can understand it. I don't need you to tell me. I can, I can prosper. I can prosper. I can, um, I can deep dive in my own thought process because mm-hmm. I understand the system. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's – I'll stop there. <laughs> is that about it i think that's, that's about, about it, it. I, think, yeah, I think i, was we looking got, at I think my we got notes a lot too. of it um well let, let me bring this up here I and mean, this is this is a plug but it's a very healthy plug you know we talk about the great suit a lot and those guys are brilliant brilliant really appreciate what they've done for the industry um but if you want to s- step into it and not dive headfirst financially and time-wise, and you want to understand that what we do and how we took the applied functional science methodology, methodolo- excuse me, methodological, but those methodologies, it's a, con- it's, a, it's, a, it's a conglomerate of methodologies and put it into the training conditioning world, not just for movement, not just for one-on-one, but for group, um, but for operations and for the, even the mindset training, even the behavioral side of things and how we make it work in a training and conditioning gym, you know, um, in a boutique style, uh, reach, reach out to us. We have a, a program that is rad, and it is literally open sourcing everything that we've learned and continue to learn. It's literally a growing course. It's Once you buy in, every update that comes to it, you get it for free. So it's called the MDMC, Multidimensional Movement Coaching Program. It is a mentorship. It's not just an online course, but a mentorship. And every single coach that has uh, been part of Gymnazo goes through it. And I think we have the best coaching staff that I've ever come across in my entire life. And we get uh, reaffirmed by that, who coaches come visit us. And that's not um, being prideful. 
That is being prideful. It's a healthy prideful. Like I'm very proud of our team and the capacity that we have because I think it's, um, it will revolutionize the industry and we just got to bring more of you into it because the world needs it. We need more potential and more confidence in our training world. We are the Tesla. Ooh, say it. <laughs> we are the Tesla of the training community. We're, we're a luxury, <laughs> top of the line. Pushing the innovation. Pushing innovation, that's our right. Our defense is our offense. <laughs> I could end with that. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you very much, Kalina. Hey, my pleasure, and uh, thanks for chatting about this. This is uh, one of our favorite t topics and obviously kind of the foundation for Gymnazo, so this is important to us. Yeah, right on.